And like I said, each week um, I'm going to ask you to go through your your uh, handbook and in all the areas where you um, have uh, uh, where it tells you to read a certain uh, portion of scripture or to write it out. Please do that before the class begins. Uh, that's your homework. Uh, ah, Denise McCune's here. God bless you, Denise. Let me mark you down as present. Wonderful. I'm going to have a good group tonight. Amen. Good Scott. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here, and thank you for joining us, and I'm really believing that as a result of this teaching that you're going to have a tremendous measure of healing, a tremendous measure of of a breakthrough in your life as a result of these truths that we're teaching. And I want to remind you and I want to let you know that um, we um, have to walk in present day truth. Um, a lot of people, a lot of denominations, a lot of organizations, they walk in truth, but it's truth that was revealed a hundred years ago. I know there's some organizations that that's the main thrust. That's their main focus is you know, the Lord poured his spirit out on Azusa Street and, and revealed certain tenets of doctrinal truths. And over 100 years later, that's still their main focus. That's their main rejoicing. Everything they do is built on that. We, we must not just be aware of where God was. But we got to know where God is. And there's been at least two to three major moves of God and present-day truths revealed since the Azusa Street Revival in the 1900s. And uh, many have not moved on to embracing present-day truth. Some examples of present-day truth is the understanding of how fivefold ministry works with modern day, um, the modern-day church. Um, the the uh, gifts of the Spirit operating amongst the army believers. How God is raising an army believers to conquer the seers of, of uh, society. And these are present day truths that we must embrace. So you're going to be hearing some present day truths, revelations, and I pray that your eyes of enlightenment will be opened. And that it won't be how sometimes when you're in a darker room and you step into a bright sunshine, initially you're blinded. So if, if anything you're teaching uh, causes momentarily um, spiritual blindness, as though it were, I just encourage you to study the scriptures and to continue with the teaching and, 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 and God will bring the revelation of present day truth through his word. In Jeremiah 33 and 3 it says, Ask me and I will tell you remarkable secrets you do not know about things to come. The key there is we have to ask him. We have to seek him to receive these secrets, these tenets of truth. You see, an intimate relationship with God is probably one of our deepest needs. It goes without saying that God is mostly interested in each and every single one of you individually. God is interested in your ministry, in your life, in, in revealing his power to you. And religion and rules only lead us to frustration and rebellion. Uh, many of us grew up in environments that were uh, religious, realistic in their mindset, rules-based, not relationship-based. And if, if we do not develop a deep, intimate walk with God, and if, if we do only what we do because of religion and rules, that brings frustration to people's lives as well as rebellion. The fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil works only on the external and really has no power to produce change. I, I've said it before. If, if someone's leading a group of people or, or, or shepherding the ecclesia or um, uh, in any measure of, of serving the body of Christ, they could be mean enough and harsh enough with the application of condemning scriptures and harsh condemning uh, words to make someone line up to an exterior facet of look or appearance, you could do that within one month. But it takes a lifetime for the heart to be transformed. See, as we realize that God is in love with us, just as we are, and we can love others 
and serve the Lord from a grateful heart, not out of duty, not out of fear. I, 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 now that God's bringing me on this journey that I've been on now for almost three years, I actually feel sorry now for people that are in environments that are fear-based, controlling, manipulating, dominating, and it's all the products of the view of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, once again, this may be new revelation for you. I pray and I ask you, just listen and open your heart, and you will find that God will confirm his word to you, even with signs following. And one of those signs is going to be transformation of removing the, the, the garments of shame and guilt and condemnation that want to weigh you down. And, you know, this awareness for some people can leave you feeling vulnerable because, because when the, the, your eyes become open. But don't lament if you've been walking a path that is a path of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But rather, just change. Just, just say from this day forward, I'm going to allow the tree of life to become my focus. So, um, it's important that, um, and I'm going to do my best to be as transparent with you as I possibly can. Because the tree of life is truth. And I may, in my transparency during this teaching, share some things. I'm not sharing them out of bitterness. I'm not sharing them out of a desire to cause anyone to be discredited or disrespected. It's just sharing with you my journey to help you to be able to connect and understand the importance of the tree of life. Because the Bible has to be our ultimate authority and our ultimate truth. Not any particular group, not just any person because of their stature or their uh, position. It has to be biblical revelation as our authority. See, the, the, the enemy loves to introduce gray areas. He did it in the very beginning when he went to Adam and Eve. He told Eve, did he really say that you're going to die? And he does that even today. The fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a perversion of truth, which means there may be a thread of truth in it, but it's actually a perversion. And the enemy has always tried to put a rift between God and man by causing man to question God's rhema, God's word, and God's truth. The world does this by saying truth is relative, relevant truth. What's truth for you is truth for you. What's truth for me is truth for me. And everyone's running around with this measure of truth. Well, that's very, very dangerous because that is not how uh, the, 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 the revelation of truth is. There is an all transcending truth, and that is God's word. Not what I think, not what you think, not what this people group thinks. It's what does God say, because his word stands as the ultimate authority in all teaching and in measuring truth. So it's very deadly to share this kind of idea and ideology and mindset with the world and values of relativism. I, I, I uh, led a church in the North Bay of San Francisco for seven years, and I dealt with that dead on. And it's a very, very destructive philosophy, the, the idea of relevant truth. And what we can understand is most sin starts out as a thought. That's why the Bible instructs us in Corinthians to cast down every imagination, to take captive every thought and make them line up with God's word, both the logos as well as the rhema. The longer we entertain wrong ideas, the more likely we are begin to believe them. I'm personally very careful who I allow to speak into my life. I don't allow just anybody and everybody to prophesy into my life. I want to know the, their fruit, their character, where they're coming from, because that's a very important thing when it comes to prophetic uh, um, ministry. So the fall of man actually came as Adam tried to be in control and Adam tried to make his own choice. As we surrender our areas of our life, we decrease the chance of making bad choices by leaning upon the power of God's Word. Bad choices in life ends up separating us from God, where good choices will end up drawing us closer to Him. And that's a great, great litmus test for whether your choices are good or bad. 
are they resulting in drawing you closer to God? The people you hang with, the people you go to coffee with, the people you choose to be friends, do they encourage and build a desire for you to draw closer to God, or do you find yourself drifting away from God? And that's a really good litmus test. At some point in our walk with the Lord, making good choices will stop being hard and they'll start becoming our primary response to things in life. So let's go ahead and uh, we're going to go ahead and kick off this second week of teaching. And I'm going to begin again by reading from Genesis 2, verse 16 through 17. And our focus again is on the tree of life as opposed and as in contrast to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I'm leaning back and hitting my screen back here. I adjust myself here. It's hard to get everything just perfect because it's just, oh, it's just life. It's just how life is. All right, I think I'm good now. But the Lord warned him, you may freely eat of the fruit of the tree in the garden, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. So, the tree of life is more than just a backdrop to a Bible story. It is a way of life. When you begin to understand through this teaching how we must do everything we do, not just for the kingdom of God, but just in life in general, with the tree of life in view, it transforms how we think, how we handle things, how we handle people, relationships. Everything in our life becomes transformed. In chapter 1, the first scriptures tell us about the creation of our world and define God as the creator and ruler who has authority and dominion. The second story in the Bible tells us about Adam and Eve, the first sin, and the two trees in the Garden of Eden. It's the, it's the second story for a reason. Everything else in the Bible hinges on it. From it we learn humanity has to choose every day between the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So let's look at some ideas behind the tree of life, what drives the mindset of those that are that are bound by the tree of life versus the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we're going to look at these two um, these two things. The tree of life offers freedom, whereas the tree of the knowledge of good and evil brings bondage. The tree of life is centered around grace, God's enabling power in our life. Most people don't truly understand grace. They think grace is simply salvation. Grace in its original understanding in the Confession of the New Testament is God's empowerment to do for us what we cannot accomplish or do on our own. All of us, when we purchase into God's stream, become recipients in need, in need of the grace of God. Whereas the view of the tree of God of knowledge of good and evil is the law. The Bible says, scriptures, just <clears throat> the tree of life, the, the view is eternal life. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil leads to death. In the tree of life, it's God is a good God. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is God's a judge. Watch out, he's going to get you. He watches everything you do. God's going to judge you. Be sure your sins will find you out. These are all statements of people with the view of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the tree of life, the view of God is God as, as a forgiving God. But God, again, in, in, in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that we're just condemned. We're condemned because of our lifestyle. We're condemned because of our failures. See, in, in the tree of life, we understand that God is forgiving and he is not a judgmental God until the time of judgment comes. Let me tell you, the time of judgment is not yet until the end of time comes. That's when God will deal with everything as a judging God. Until that point in time, he is a forgiving God. And there's always a chance for somebody. The only, the only way someone has no chance is if they've given up in their mind and felt like it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. I've messed up too bad. God can't love me. God can't forgive me. And because your perception is of such that God cannot love you, 
God cannot forgive you. And you heap so much self-condemnation on yourself, then truly you are unloved and you are unforgiven. It has nothing to do with the ability of God or God's grace or mercy or love. It's all your approach and your mindset. When we study scripture, it's always good to find the first place our subject is mentioned. In our journey to walk in communion with God and freedom, we must find out why we may be separated from God and why we may be in bondage. Let me tell you, some of you as we go into these studies, it's going to shock you the reasons why you are living in bondage and in separation from God. And it's going to, it's going to all point towards a, relig a religious spirit, a religious system, that it's important for you to become delivered from this religious spirit and religious system. The first place in the Bible that separation from God is mentioned is in Genesis chapter 3. As we will see, a bad choice by the first people caused this separation. It was sin that caused separation from, uh, from man communing with God. And we read this in, in Romans 5 and 12. Prior to Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve walked with God and enjoyed his presence. It was a beautiful scene. I mean, imagine it. It's a beautiful day. They're walking through this gorgeous 6,000 square mile garden that God's given to them. There's no, there's no sin. There's no famine. There's no sickness. It's, it's, it's indeed truly a paradise. And God has created man to walk daily in communion and fellowship with him. And it's, it's just a beautiful thing. And God's put this tree in the garden called the tree of life that when man eats of it, he would never die. And, and it's just a beautiful, wonderful setting. And, and, and the Bible describes it as, as God walking with Adam in the cool of the day. I mean, can you imagine the conversations they talked about? I mean, imagine walking hand in hand, day by day, with God. See, God was revealing his master plans to Adam. It must have been just an incredible up-close and personal relationship. Just the kind of relationship God desires with us today. The Word tells us God made these two human beings in his image and gave Adam dominion over everything he had created. Guess what else was in the, in, uh, upon earth? It was Lucifer and all the fallen angels. And God had established not only for Adam and Eve to have natural dominion over the entire earth, but supernatural and spiritual dominion. God gave Adam authority through the relationship that he established with him. Without this relationship, there would be no authority. That's why the enemy constantly tries to hinder and get in between our walk with God. When we try to sit down and start praying, he whispers in our ear. God doesn't want to talk to you. You failed. You're wasting your time. God's not listening to you. You've got to reject those voices of lie. And every day seek to strengthen your personal, intimate walk with God. To not only come to know his voice, but to obey his voice. To flow in the rhema of his word and to know the presence of his power and glory. When Adam and Eve sinned, they caused this authority to become forfeited. Not as a simple judgment of their sin, but because it separated them from their intimate relationship with God. Again, authority comes from relationship. Our relationship with God. Through deception and rebellion, the serpent took authority and dominion that God had given to man. The Bible tells us that Satan's desire was to exalt his throne above the stars of God. Until the fall of man, he lacked power and influence to set up rulership. Jesus called Satan, in John 12 and 31, the ruler of this world. And he continues ruling in every area that people do not decide to step up in their rightful place as sons and daughters of God and cause spiritual displacement to take place, where light casts out darkness. Wherever you live, Whatever area you're in, it is the will of God for spiritual displacement to occur. I moved into an apartment complex here in North Houston back in the month of November. And I have made several loops completely around this apartment walking. 
People thought I was out there exercising, but I was actually praying, loosing angels over this apartment. Because I believe it is the will of God for you to affect spiritual displacement. Amen. I hope in your time of homework during the week that you wrote out 1 John 5 and 19. And again, each week I would ask you to go to the next uh, lesson and to, to take at least five minutes to go to each shaded box and to write out each one of these scriptures that um, uh, they request or, and are requiring uh, for you to write out. So today we'll go ahead and just quickly go to 1 John and John, um, excuse me, yeah, First John 5 and 19. So First John 5 and 19 uh, reads as such, and I'm reading from the NLT Bible. We know that we are children of God, and that the world around us is under the control of the evil one. So we do understand this, but again, I want to uh, express to you that it is God's divine expression for us to live in authority above it. Colossians 1 and 21 tells us that we were once so far from God. The Bible says that when we were in sin, we were his enemies, separated from him by our own evil thoughts and actions. This is what sin does. Sin separates. Now, I'm not talking about a mistake in someone's life and that's it, you're doomed forever. That's, again, the view of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, if you will learn as a Christian as a child of God, to quickly repent for sin and forsake it. The Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord won't hear me. And and grace is not a measure that you can just keep sinning every day and, and, and just quickly ask God to forgive you to go right back to the sin because uh, God loves you so much that he will not allow that to continue because sin is extremely destructive. But uh, I'm talking about unrepented sin. Sin that you try to ignore and you hope that God or others won't find out about. This kind of sin separates and this separation costs us our freedom and the authority over Satan that God gives to his children. So be sure you live a life of continual daily repentance and seeking to be overcomers by the power of the blood of the Lamb. Praise God he's made a way to end this separation. It was through Jesus Christ that God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and earth by means of his blood on Calvary. Colossians 1 and 20 tells us. So before we proceed any further, you should know that the starting point to a relationship with God and walking in freedom is accepting that we are sinners and that Jesus paid the penalty for our sin by shedding his blood and dying on the cross. I know most of you here, you understand that completely, but it goes out saying, we don't work our sins out and our salvation by works, by doing good deeds, by trying. It's simply accepting the fact that he paid the penalty and his blood was shed by dying on the cross. So once again, uh, it's asked you to write out John 14 and 6, as well as Romans 10 and 13. And again, because this is our first, um, our second lesson, I'm going to go ahead and read these two scriptures now. But in the future, I hope you will have written out these scriptures for your, your use. John 14 and 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And Romans 10 and 13 tells us, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, has there been a time when I asked Jesus to come to my heart? Amen. And, and and I know each one of you, you've got an experience with God. And I know that we have a, a uh, present day truth understanding that uh, to receive um, God into our life, not only do we ask Him to come to our hearts, but we, we choose to repent, to turn from our sins. We choose to uh, have those sins washed away by being baptized in His precious name. And then we allow the infilling of the Holy Spirit that comes with the initial sign of speaking with tongues to empower us to live an overcoming and powerful life over sin. So, separation and the first sin. We're going to continue on. The Lord planted all sorts of trees in the garden, 
beautiful trees that produce delicious fruit. At the center of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But the Lord gave the warning, you may freely eat of, of any fruit in the garden except the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of its fruit, you will surely die. Now, if you'll notice when you read in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, um, you'll notice that it was the enemy that came into the garden. And he was trying to deceive Eve. He attacked her lack of understanding of what God had said. Now, of course, I hold Adam truly responsible because the, the principle of leadership is it is your responsibility as a leader to make sure that those that you are serving as a leader have full understanding of what God said. Now, the Bible says that Adam walked in the garden with God in the cool of the day. But I, it's apparent that Adam must not have went to Eve after that time of communion with God and shared with her verbatim what God had said because she did not really know what God said. She just had a general understanding. So, in verse 7 and 8, of course, in of, of, of Genesis 3, uh, we read that um, Eve uh, became deceived and she became convinced by the enemy. She saw that the tree was beautiful and the fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom that Satan told her she would have and so she ate it. And then she went and gave it to her husband, which really he should know better because he knew. Adam was, Eve was deceived, Adam wasn't. I don't know if it was a relationship of this woman in his life, but for whatever reason, even though Adam knew he should not eat of the tree. He was clear because he was there when God spoke to him. Instead, he disobeyed and ate of the tree. And we read in verse 9, the Bible says that in their shame, and, 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 and that's what happens with sin and failure, we battle shame. Shame is the feeling that somehow I'm, I'm, I'm uh, defected. I made a mistake. I'll never make it. And we, we just kind of beat ourselves up. And so they, first of all, went and hid themselves from the Lord uh, when he came to walk with them in the cool of the day. And in verse 9, the Bible says that the Lord God called to man, where are you? I don't believe that was a condemning voice saying, Adam, where are you at? I believe it was a heartbroken cry. To this, to to to, to, to mankind who he made in his image, that he was enjoying fellowship with each day. It was the cry, Adam, where are you? Adam, something's wrong. Something's happened. So don't miss this part. Adam and Eve hid, but God came looking for them. That's the beauty of it. The devil loves to twist it to make it seem that somehow. We have to crawl across broken glass and do some incredible feat of, of, of lengthy prayer. And, 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 and that's what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil passes from religious mindsets. Here, Adam and Eve were hiding, but God came looking for them. The Bible says God was seeking for a sinful man. See, God is in love. With his creation regardless he is yes in love with sinful mankind and that's why he gave his life for us you see many times um, uh, I, I get people that that will contact me and I'll say brother Arcovio I got a situation would you pray and I'll say sure I will lift it in prayer I'll lift it to God in prayer well because they don't see any results in their mind because of religious mindsets they think, well, maybe we got to pray harder. Somehow God's not hearing us. Does that sound very familiar? It's exactly what happened with Elijah. When, when the prophets of Baal and the prophets of the grove built their altars, they cried and screamed to their God to the point they cut themselves to try to get their God's attention. That's what the spirit of religion will do to you. To cause you to try to go to great extents to convince you that God's not hearing you. You've got to pray harder. You're not praying enough. You haven't fasted enough. You haven't done enough. You've got you to gotta, you gotta 
And, and that's, that's the kind of thing that God wants to deliver us from. The Bible says he hears us always. When Elijah stepped up, he simply prayed a 28-word prayer. And God answered, and fire fell from heaven. God hears us. God knows. So i got to ask myself, are there things in my past that have caused me to want to hide from God? If it, if it is, then that is the result of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let's read James, James chapter 4 and verse 8. James 4 and verse 8 tells us, Come close to God, and God will come close to you. So every time you look to God with an open heart, He hears you, and He draws close to you. There are times you may not feel like God's close, but you must know He loves you. He loves us more than we could ever, ever understand or comprehend. And all it takes is just one look, and he comes. He draws near. Amen. It goes on to say, wash your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. That's what separates us from God. It's a love for the world, and a love for the things of the world, more than a love for God. You know, I ask people, do you pray each day? Oh, I try to, but I get busy. There's nothing in this world that should be more important than your intimate time with God. That has got to be sacred and valuable to you. Second Chronicles 15 and verse 2 says, And he went out to meet King Asa, and as he was returning from the battle, Listen to me, Asa, he shouted. Listen, all ye people of Judah and Benjamin. The Lord will stay with you, as long as you stay with him. Wow. Did you hear that? The Lord will stay with you as long as you stay with him. No, God has never abandoned anybody. People abandon God in their minds. Allow the lies of condemnation, guilt, and fear to drive them from the presence of God. The Bible goes on to say, whenever you seek him, you will find him. But if you abandon him, he will abandon you. Adam and Eve sinned by eating the fruit of the tree that was forbidden to them. This fruit was not just any fruit. It was the knowledge of good and evil. The understanding of what is right and wrong. So they, they mistakenly thought because of Satan's lies that by eating this fruit, it would make them like God. Learning the truth about the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil will will empower us as believers to avoid making this mistake. You've got to ask yourself, have I used knowledge of God as the basis of my relationship? How much I know of God? How many scriptures I can quote? I grew up in circles where it was very, very common to memorize every scripture that, that embraced the, the understanding of God and his Godhead, and who he was, and the scriptural relationship of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and, and mistakenly, many people try to use this knowledge as the basis, not their relationship. There are four truths about the free, of the tree of the knowledge of the evil we must understand. The first truth is the fruit is knowledge. You see, most of us think that the fruit in, in, the, in, the, in the garden was like an apple or an orange. But it's not. The fruit of the tree is just what the Bible says. It was knowledge. Knowledge can be explained as information, data, ideas, worldviews, thought patterns. But it's also knowledge of good and evil. God was basically saying to Adam and Eve, if you change your way of thinking, it will create separation between us. If you change your world view, you won't be able to understand me and relate to me properly. But Satan came and deceived them and said, it's not going to hurt you to think this way. Note, 
God didn't say it was wrong to have knowledge. In fact, God said to Israel through Hosea the prophet and Hosea 4 and 6 that, that his people were destroyed for lack of knowledge. See, if, if you went and had surgery and there was a major surgery, couldn't you be thankful if that surgeon had knowledge? Um, or, or a mechanic, the knowledge to repair an engine? Uh, for a while there on TV, there was, there was a funny commercial by Holiday Inn and it was someone who just showed up at some skilled position like flying a plane or, 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 or a scientist in a project or even a surgeon and, and he would just step in and, and, and they'd ask, well, what qualifies you to do this? I stayed at Holiday Inn last night. So <laughs> it's kind of a dumb commercial. But, but knowledge uh, is, is not bad. But the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 1, we, we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up or makes a person proud. Love builds up. So the issue isn't necessarily knowledge. Rather, it's the motive behind its acquisition. Why do you want to have knowledge? Why do you want to gain knowledge? In other words, what is your reason for desiring knowledge? Is it to gain God's wisdom? In God's perception, you know, I, I, I really hear a lot of people, especially the prophetic people in this hour, that they, they get into, into mysticism, even new age concepts and mindsets that are not biblical. That's why we must be students of God's word, to gain knowledge that we may understand and know God in the proper context, in the proper way. And um, according to Colossians, uh, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 3 uh, let's read Colossians 2 and 3 in him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge isn't that beautiful that when we would come to know God closer and we absorb his logos his written word to gain the understanding of the scriptures so we can have the mind of Christ not a mind that is twisted by Hollywood and movies and, and, and perceptions that are, are humanistic in, 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 their, in their, their reasoning and their thought processes. But what does the Bible say? When our minds are washed by the water of the word, then we become truly God conscious. And so when we discover Jesus, we find hidden in him all wisdom and knowledge, the Bible says. Wow, isn't that powerful? All the wisdom and knowledge we need can be found in an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. That is so powerful. The second principle is the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is deadly. The Lord gave Adam his warning. You may freely eat of any tree in any fruit in the garden except the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. Now we know that the second they ate the fruit, they didn't drop dead, but that death began. It began in their relationship, it began in their thought process, and it began for all humankind. And that's the law of sin. You don't have to teach a child to lie or to cheat or to steal. That's human nature. It takes training, it takes discipline, it takes the leading of the Spirit to help people to overcome these works of the flesh. Eating from the tree of knowledge, consuming knowledge, in your pursuit of godliness is deadly. Let me repeat that again. Consuming knowledge in your pursuit of godliness is deadly. Satan didn't tempt Eve with blatant rebellion. He simply said, go ahead, eat the fruit. It's going to make you like God. Satan tempted Eve with her desire to become like God. Often the desire to know is a direct opposition to the desire to trust. I, I battle this. I like to be in the know. I like facts. But sometimes God just wants us to trust him, to trust his word, to trust his 
nature as a sovereign, loving God. Amen. We can set out to gain all the information, all the ideas, and all the data needed to run our lives efficiently. And in a sense, we become God of our own lives. Instead, God wants us to trust Him. This is such a beautiful word. This is really ministering to me today as I'm teaching you because everything about my journey in the past two years has been a journey of trust. Sometimes not knowing what's going to happen from month to month. But oh, what a beautiful thing to know that we can trust Him. My friend, let me tell you something. He has never, ever, ever failed us. He has never failed us one time. Everything I've suffered, everything I've gone through has been a result of my own flesh, my own desire to try to control and to run my own life. You see, we make terrible masters of our own life. When we put our lives in the hands of the one and true master, and he knows what's best for us. And that's that's where we don't have to have the knowledge of knowing everything. We can simply trust Him. Why don't you right now pause and just close your eyes. Just maybe lift your hands to Him. and just I want you to mouth the words to your Savior. Lord, I trust you. Whatever situation I'm in, I don't have to understand it. I don't have to have all the knowledge. I simply choose to trust you. Because brothers and sisters, we can control our lives. We could be self-sufficient, but we only depend on ourselves. But in the end, we would end up losing our lives. And this, this is, you know, if, if your nature, I can tell, I'll be transparent with you, my nature is to be in control. I want to be in control and I want to be able to know that I can take care of things. I mean, I'm a very, very independent person. I do not like asking anybody for help. Sometimes it's pride for me to be able to have my own strength and my own ability. And one of the things that God's been slowly, slowly teaching me is there is a beauty in humility of leaning on others and depending on others and needing others. There's no pride in being so strong and so financially independent and so secure in your life that you don't need anybody. God designed, his kingdom principles are designed for us to be interdependent, depending on each other, leaning on each other, amen, and, 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 and strengthening and helping each other. So of course, we can read in, in, in Genesis chapter three, Verses 22 through 24, and I, I encourage you to be writing these answers down as I give them to you in your shaded area. But again, this is your homework you do each week, so next week when we go to do our teaching, these areas should already be filled in. And in Genesis 3, verses 22 through 24, it tells us that, um, I'm sorry, I, I hit the wrong button there. Then the Lord God said, Look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out and take of the fruit from the tree of life and eat it? Then they will live forever. So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden, and he sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. And after sending them out, the Lord stationed mighty cherubims to the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. It could be that this Garden of Eden is still on this earth, but mankind has never discovered it because God put cherubims, spiritual beings, to blind and to keep people from discovering again this garden that God had created. But I do know this, that God had to drive them out because if they'd eat of the tree of life, they'd have lived for, forever in their fallen state. As a matter of fact, if you read through Genesis, you discover that in the beginning, people lived to be up to a thousand years old. 900 years, and 800 years, and 600 years. 
But God looked down upon earth after, um, before the flood, and, and he realized that the heart of man was wicked. He realized that if mankind even lived, you know, 500 years, a wicked man could, could, could uh, derive incredible wickedness. Think about wicked leaders that are just in position of authority and influence for, for four to eight years. How much uh, devastation they can wreck. So God had to not only drive Adam and Eve out of the garden so they would not eat the tree of life and live forever, but he had to in introduce uh, diseases and things that shorten man's life to the, the, the amount of life that God gives to man is 74 years, that's what the Bible says. That's the amount, the amount of time that God gives to man on the earth. And eight years after 74 years is a gift from God. And, and we know people still live with proper eating and proper health a hundred years. But most of the time, a man is not very productive from the age 75 to 100. Uh, some men are, are able to be very productive even into their 90s. But it's not very common for it to happen because of disease and sicknesses and different mental disorders that take hold of man, such as dementia and Alzheimer's and things like this. So, so let's continue on. Adam and Eve did not die physically when they ate from the tree of knowledge, but they did die spiritually. They became separated in their relationship with God. Through Adam's disobedience, death entered the entire human race. And we were all born from that point forward spiritually dead and in need of resurrection. And that's where the good news is that through Jesus Christ, we can have access to the tree of life. If we pursue Life himself, in our desire for godliness, will become truly like him. So the key here is pursuing an intimate relationship with God. He will lead you and guide you into all truths. You don't pursue godliness by, by becoming intimately acquainted with what, what, the, what the Bible says about every single issue. Should we become students of the world? Absolutely. But we learn to become overcomers through the blood of the Lamb through our relationship with Jesus Christ, through what he did for us on Calvary. And then it is his Holy Spirit that empowers us and helps us to walk according to his word. The third principle is the fruit is consumed. The woman was conceived and the fruit looked so fresh, excuse me, the woman was convinced and the fruit looked so fresh and delicious and it would make her so wise. So she ate of the fruit and gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it or two, Genesis 3 and verse 6. Eating is not just putting food in your mouth. It literally means to consume, ingest things into the innermost part of who you are. Ideas are ingested in our minds, and that's where sin is conceived. That's why we have to guard our eyes and our ears for what we see and what we hear. I see people that they watch absolute garbage stuff. I knew someone that was reading a book of Zen and was reading Buddhist religions. I was like, why are you reading that? Oh, it's interesting to me and I just want to learn more about it. That one day I might be able to meet a Buddhist and relate to them and win them. My friend, you're not going to win somebody by, by relating to, to, you're going to win them by being, becoming more like God by becoming full of the rhema and logos of God's word. That's what will convince and transform people. Amen? That's how you discover the genuine. You don't discover the genuine by studying the counterfeit. Even in banking and in the business world, when, they, when people handle money, they teach them to handle money to learn what the true and authentic uh, bills feel like. And after they've handled hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of the genuine wine, they'll slip in a counterfeit, and the second they touch it, they know it's wrong. You don't discover about the counterfeit by, you don't, you don't discern witchcraft by studying uh, uh, the, the, the Wiccan religion. You don't discover, you don't uh, uh, know more about um, whatever wicked thing that is, Satanism or any false religion or any wickedness. You go as close to God as you can and you become so acquainted with his word and his presence and his voice that the second something false shows up, you know it. Amen? Amen. So be careful what you eat. 
talking with you in your minds and your, your ears and things you hear. So how did the first sin come about? Eve talked to Adam about it, they had a conversation, and began working with this idea of eating of this tree of the knowledge of good, of, of, of the knowledge of good and evil. Consume means to take something outside of you and to put it in yourself. See, parents especially understand the importance of this. For example, many parents don't want kids watching horror movies because we know through the eyes they can get something inside their minds that can torment them for the rest of their lives. We don't want them reading certain type, type of ideologies because we know that if they become infected or polluted by reading the wrong books, it can cause them to fall into ruin and despair. Ideas are important. And you got to be careful what ideas you allow to go into your mind. So your, your next um, homework that I, you were supposed to do was, can you think of a personal example to illustrate the danger of consuming certain kinds of knowledge? And you have a space there to write your answer. The fourth principle is, the fruit causes separation. The man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So once again, the fourth principle is, the fruit of the tree of knowledge and of evil doesn't join closer to God. It literally separates from you. Religious mindsets actually work against drawing close to God and coming to know Him in a deeper and more intimate manner. Now remember, it was man who hid from God. Many have been taught that Adam and Eve sinned and that God in His holiness and righteousness turned His back on Adam and Eve because His holiness cannot stand to be in the presence of a sinful man. I can lift my hand and say, Amen, I've heard that. But that's not what the Bible says. Again, truth must be derived from what the Word of God says, not religious mindsets and ideologies that are birthed from certain people groups and religious orders. I pray that your mind can be washed by the water of God's Word today. The Bible says that Adam and Eve sinned their eyes became opened, they covered up, and then tried to hide. But God, who was walking in the garden, searching for them, said, Adam, where are you? The truth is, Adam and Eve made an incorrect judgment of God. They felt that God would be angry with them and against them because they had failed and disobeyed him. Instead, he was even more eager to draw closer to them. And as the Bible says in Isaiah, Come, let us reason together. Though your sins are as scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, I will make them as wool. This is the presentation of God that this world needs to see. A loving God that is eager and ready to reconcile the relationship between Him and his people. That's why he said, where are you, Adam? Where are you? You see, God wasn't waiting behind a tree, watching them and waiting for them to fail so he could jump on them and judge them. No, mankind actually judged God even after they failed. Too many people in this day and time, when they present God to people, when they preach their sermons, when they get up, they present an incorrect God. Not a loving God, not a merciful God, but a God who is full of vengeance and judgment and hatred. God is not on his throne holding an axe, waiting to cut us off. God, the word of God tells us, is love. 1 John 4 and verse 8 tells us, But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Wow, that's a heavy statement. I can't say that I know God if I don't know love. That's why I pray God baptize us with love. God help me and teach me to love the unlovable, to love even those that would persecute and try to injure me. See. I don't know that kind of love, but I'm so hungry for that kind of love. 
kind of love that can love through hate, love through pain, love through disappointment. We need a revolution of God's love. Doesn't matter how much I fast or pray, or how much I prophesy, or how many books I write, or meetings I've spoke around the world. If I am going to say that I know God, I must know love. We need a baptism of love. Because God is love. The Bible also tells us in 1 Peter 4 and 8 that love covers a multitude of sins. It doesn't mean that you ignore it, you sweep it under the carpet. Love goes right into a person's life that is bound by sin and gently and lovingly reaches to them as a father or to a true son to help salvage them and keep them from destroying their life by warning them and admonishing them. Let's read 1 Peter 4 and 8. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. For love covers a multitude of sins. All of us have baggage. All of us have shortcomings. There's not a one of us in the kingdom of God that is perfect. There are times we have attitudes and, and, and we get on each other's nerves. And, but love covers all. Love is the most powerful thing, is what Paul said. He said the three most powerful things in the earth, faith, hope, and charity. But charity and love is the most powerful. So I pray that we can find the grace of God to show deep love for each other. I've had people walk away from me and they've spoken against me harshly because they felt I wasn't keeping some doctrinal statement. I was keeping some doctrinal standard, pure. And so they would come to me and they would shatter my heart. And they would say, I'm sorry, I cannot walk with you anymore. I cannot be with you anymore. But that's not love. That's not environments of love. And I thank God that God has delivered me from the fear-driven program and 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 um, uh, you know, uh, uh, works-based environments. When we see His heart for us, we'll run to Him instead of hiding from Him. If and when we sin. We'll run to him and we'll say, God, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to wound you with that. I'm going to do my best to not do that again. But God, would you forgive me? Would you empower me to do better? That's the view of the tree of life. Romans 8 tells us, verse 38 to 39, that, that, that nothing can separate us from the love of God. I want to read that to you because it's a very powerful verse. Romans 8, verse 38 through verse 39 tells us, And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries for tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or the earth beneath alone. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. My brothers and sisters, let the love of God become apparent to you. Let him wash you with his love. And let's start a revolution of love beginning amongst us as believers and then being extended to this lost and dying world. Here's the reasons why the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is deadly. The Bible says that the fruit of this tree was good for food. It was delightful to the eyes, and it was desirable to make a person wise. That's what Genesis 3 and 6 tells us. 
So the, 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 the fruit of the tree of knowledge does not look evil. It doesn't have the appearance of being deadly. But that's what makes it so deadly. Eve assumed that the fruit was good for food. In other words, it was very satisfying. What Eve thought would be good for her turned out to be deadly. Knowledge, even without love and wisdom and understanding, can be satisfying. If we can figure out a system of right and wrong and do it right, then we can be quite satisfied by doing right things. It feels secure because we, we put this list down things that we should not do and we should do and if we're disciplined enough we can check each one off without love without wisdom without understanding we can be smug and satisfied but this is deadly my friend because god says we can come to him only through grace by faith and not by works and this is where religious order turn so many people away from an intimate relationship with God and turns them into robots simply seeking the approval of men and climbing the ladders that systems prop up on walls from the climb to receive recognition, words of affirmation, to be seen, to be known, to be heard, and to be what we would call used by God. And it's deadly. It's absolutely deadly because you can't connect with God by simply doing more good things and lesser bad things. We connect with God through our relationship. On several occasions, Jesus rebuked the spiritual leaders and Bible scholars for that, that day because they got it all wrong. He said, you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe him who he sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me, and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. We can only come to God and receive grace by His grace and through faith. That's what Paul said. He talked about the wicked man he was. In Galatians, he said, I live by the faith of the Son of God who died for me. That's where our confidence is in, in what Jesus Christ did for us on Calvary by shedding His blood. Not by our works and our efforts, our righteousness, our good deeds. It is through the power of his blood and through what he has done for us as a finished work. It's a delight to the eyes. The, the, the kind of tree of knowledge thinking usually leads us to be live by a set of rules that make us look very good on the outside to other people. I've heard people say, oh, so-and-so, they live so holy. And they're simply re referencing an outward lifestyle that they can observe. And it could even be beyond an appearance of dress or how you fix your hair or what you have on or not on. It could be a life of, of seeming dedication, a life of prayer, a life of reading God's word. And people can look at that and it can be delightful. That's deadly. The fruit is deadly because we become consumed with others with what others think of us and finding that approval amongst men rather than seeking to be approved of God or what God thinks of us. I've led churches, and I'm embarrassed to say this. But I got in the pulpit and I preached things to condemn people and to force them to meet a certain set of rules. Not because I felt God had spoke to me in the office, because a rumor came to me by a phone call or by someone who said, Brother Arcovio, the district board thinks, Pastor so-and-so, 
some big name official person that somebody thinks that you're a compromiser and you're not standing for truth. You need to get up from your pulpit and you need to teach to let the world know this is what you stand for. I had a fan member approach me and, and this fan member at one time the church they were leading was supporting us financially to, to, to the tune of a great amount of money and looked at me and said do you believe and begin to go down the list of certain rules that this particular denomination stood very strong with and I said you know what that's not really any of your business oh yes it is you need to get up and let the world know what you believe and stand for it others need to see it in you well that's what he was taught and that's what he truly believed and because I would not ascribe to it by telling him yes down the line I believe that because I didn't they withdrew all the support from me the very next month and his statement to me was we're going to give this offering to someone who believes in holiness and stands for true truth it was very devastating to me but you know I discovered God's my supplier and I thank God that at that moment I was true to my heart I was true to the principle of pleasing God and honoring him first and seeking his approval so you have a space there to look up Matthew 23 and verse 27 and to write in that space um, uh, what you believe this verse means to you and we'll quickly read Matthew 23 and 27 what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you hypocrites and Pharisees for you are like whitewashed tombs beautiful on the outside but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sides sorts of impurity so write in that space there what you think this verse means to you the next space gives you an opportunity to write has there ever been a time in your life when all looked good on the outside but you knew there was death on the inside describe at that time here so that's a space for you to write in and again these spaces my friend are for your homework to do before our class not during our class so uh, be sure to do this next week uh, take time sometime next week to go through chapter 3 or week 3 teaching and to read the scriptures and at least write your answers in there so be ready for our teaching going back to what I said a while ago um, being transparent um, I, and I, I had been guilty of preaching things to people and saying things only because I was trying to protect my own name. I was trying to be accepted and approved amongst a group of people. And I thank God that over the past seven years, God's slowly been delivering me of that. I'm not completely delivered from worrying about what people think and say. It's, it's a slow transformation that God, through His grace, has given to me. And of course, it's when I shift my eyes from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to the tree of life in relationship with Jesus Christ and being secure in His approval. So let's continue on. The fruit is deadly because it's desire to make one wise, but wisdom itself is not deadly. From the beginning, human beings have desired to be wise. God is actually pleased with His desire. In 1 Kings we have an account of God appearing to King Solomon in a dream at night and saying, What do you want? Ask, and I will give it to you. And Solomon only asked for one thing, wisdom to govern the nation of Israel and the ability to discern good from evil. And God's response to Solomon was not a response of rejection, but rather when you read in 1 Kings 3, verses 10 through 13, the Bible says that, that God honored him. And, and God was pleased with his desire, that he didn't ask for riches or power or things that some men. The Bible says that the Lord was pleased that Solomon asked for wisdom. So God replied, because you've asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice, and have not asked for long life or wealth, the death of the enemies, I will give you what you've asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart, such as no one else has had. Then he says, besides that, I'm also going to give you what you didn't ask for, riches and fame. The Bible tells us in James that if any man lack wisdom, it doesn't say go and read books and gain great, and there's nothing wrong. 
with, with, with studying, getting degrees. And I, I support education. That's why I'm doing this class. I'm teaching you now to help you gain wisdom. But the saying goes, God can use baptized brains. But what's most important is your intimate walk with God and seeking God for knowledge and wisdom. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and will not rebuke anyone who asks for wisdom. So, but we got to seek the wisdom that's from being above. The Bible describes to us in James 1, verses 5 through 8, the wisdom that's from above. The wisdom that's from above is pure, it's peace-loving, it's gentle at all times, it's willing to yield to others, it's full of mercy and good deeds, it shows no partiality, it's always sincere. And when I, when I look at this list of God's wisdom, being a leader sometimes, I've been very, very task-driven and very purpose-driven and very A plus in my leadership style. And I, I know there were times in my life that I didn't walk with pureness or be, being peace loving or gentle or especially willing to yield to others. I tried to bend others to my will, to what I wanted. But if we have the wisdom of God, this is the kind of wisdom that God's speaking of. The wisdom that's not from above is jealous, selfish, earthly, unspiritual, and its motivations are the devil. So nothing wrong with seeking wisdom, but seek the wisdom that's from above in being pure, peace-loving, gentle at all times, willing to yield to others, full of mercy and good deeds, showing no partiality, and always sincere. So when do we need wisdom? Every day of our life. Constantly, we're making decisions. And even the smallest decisions can be made with the wisdom that's from above. If we'll discipline ourselves to pause and say, God, I need your wisdom and direction in this situation. Many people, they, they, they run to their best friend to help them make a decision. I got people I know now that they're constantly telling me, yeah, I talked to so-and-so and they suggested I should do this or that. And my comeback is, well, what does God say? Have you sought God? Oh, yeah, 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 but you know, this person's really smart and, and, and they're willing to help me and they're willing to do this and that. And it's a sad thing because they're going to end up making a mistake because they're not seeking the ultimate source of direction and wisdom and that is God. Using godly wisdom Produces the results listed above. When you ask God, be sure you really expect Him to answer. James said, A doubtful mind is unsettled as the weight of the sea, and it's driven, tossed by the wind. People like that should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. See, people that are tossed, that are one week they're this way, and the next week this way, tossed to and fro in their minds. One week they're feeling God wants to do this, then the next week they flip. And it, it's the exact opposite. Or one week they're sure, okay, God said, and this is what I'm going to do. And the next week, for whatever reason, they're just all off in left field. They're just in a tailspin. I don't know what God wants. I'm not sure. It's all confusing to me. It's because you're not asking of God, really expecting Him to answer. And you're coming to Him with a doubtful mind. And it's like a wave of the sea. You ever tried to get a piece of tobacco and stand on the ocean? It ain't going to happen. It will knock you over. Worldly wisdom leads us to decisions to sin. And it's what causes us to become alienated with God. So the next blank is read, read 1 James 3 and 3, 1 James, I mean James 1 verse 13 to 15 and ask what is the progression of sin? I'll let you answer that one. The progression of sins tells us that sin does not begin with the act. Sin begins in our minds. Like a train on a track, the more we entertain thoughts that don't line up with God's word, the faster you go down a deadly track. If we don't stop the thoughts, we go racing into deadly territory and we crash into an act that brings harm to our lives and others around us. 
We can't see sin from the outside at the point that it becomes sin. So we must develop a hunger for God and his wisdom and keep that hunger stirred up by having our minds constantly renewed by the word of God. Otherwise, we'll find ourselves separated from him before we even realize it. So that's why we've got to allow our minds to be renewed every single day by the water of God's word. Of course, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil produces shame and the attitude of victimization, and that happened with Adam. He said, I heard you and I hid and I was afraid because I was naked. And, and God said, who told you was naked? Have you eaten the fruit I command you not to eat? And Adam said, yes, but the woman you gave me, she brought me the fruit and I ate it. And, and the woman said, how could you do such a thing? And the woman says, the serpent, he tricked me. It's the old blame game. It was his fault. Well, she did it. Well, the serpent did it. See, imagine a young teenage boy who's always been a delight to his parents. He's been bright-eyed and innocent. There's been no hesitation about him until one day when his mother suddenly notices a change. He becomes serious and angry and he begins to come home with the droopy shoulders and his head hung down and the sparkles has left his eye. He barely speaks to his parents anymore and he goes straight to his room. One day while cleaning his room, his mother notices pornographic magazines hidden under his mattress. Now she begins to understand. Her innocent, wonderful, bright, lively son now has darkness and death working in him. He's become polluted. He's no longer her little boy. All the things he saw in the magazine were true. The issue is he didn't need to know it. Because of what's inside him now, he can't relate to his parents the same anymore. He's become shameful. His parents haven't changed. It is he who changed. As he spent time looking at those pictures, his innocence became polluted. Shame causes us to separate ourselves from God, so we cannot operate in the freedom that Christ has for us. Shame is a veil that comes between God and us. It covers us completely, even our eyes, so we can only see dimly who and where God is. When you become affected by shame, you're convinced that you're damaged goods. You're convinced that, that there's a point in your life that you missed a turn. You didn't make the right decision. You married the wrong person. And, and you live with shame and regret, thinking, where could I be today? Amen. Um, yeah, I just saw the question. Give me a second, Brian. I'll answer that. Where would I be today if I hadn't have made that decision? If I hadn't have missed that boat? If I hadn't have... My friend, God wants to deliver you from shame. You are exactly where God wants you. God takes great honor in taking our mistakes, our bad choices, and our misturns, and turning them to his, to his glory by putting us on the right track. The beautiful thing about serving God is when you decide to get things right with God, God doesn't make you go all the way back to the beginning where you made a mistake and start over. But he simply picks you up where you are and he puts you on a path to bring restoration to your life to where within a few days, weeks, months, years, according to his plan and purpose, you are exactly where he purposed you to be as though if you had never made a mistake or ever missed a turn. So there's a question, how did God open your understanding to separate from the legalism? It was over time. It was uh, in my heart more and more I became grieved. For instance, Brian, I would go to churches that I knew in my heart I did not believe their legalistic ways, but I knew that's how they believed and that's how they wanted me to preach. And so I would get up in front of large congregations. I would preach messages that I did not believe. But I just did it because I wanted to appease them. But afterwards, I would feel I would feel dirty. I would feel terrible. I would literally go back to my room and I would fall on the bed at the hotel and repent before God and say, God, I am so sorry I did that. Because God was convicting me of it. So it became a conviction to me over the space of about seven years. And I began the transition. I actually began the transition about 2010. It's been a very difficult transition. 
And it's been a very painful transition for the brain. So that's how God separated me from the legalistic mindsets. It was just a very painful process. But I had to make my mind up to follow after God. To quit worrying about the approval of men. Quit worrying about uh, what men could do for me. And to actually believe the prayer that David said. I will not fear what man can do to me. Because men can destroy your, your reputation, can take from you, can harm your physical man, but they cannot touch your soul. Amen. So there's the answer. So let's go on. Um, God said to Adam, um, or shame is the veil that comes between God and us. It covers us completely, even our eyes, so we can only dimly see who and where God is. God said to Adam and Eve, who told you you were naked? His tone was probably like the mother, who with great sad sadness and angst said, Who gave you these magazines? You really should not be knowing that right now in your life. See, God said, Who told you you were naked? You've eaten from the tree of the knowledge, and it polluted you. Shame causes us to do all sorts of things that keeps us from connecting with God. Shame is when we want to hide. Prior to eating the forbidden fruit, Adam and Eve were both naked and were not ashamed. Afterwards, they came up with the idea of sewing leaves, leaves together to cover themselves and then tried to hide from God's presence in the trees of the garden. So here are some of the results of shame. When you have shame, you try to cover up your life with religion and you become works-focused. Shame also causes lying, deception, and false pride. Shame will cause you to make promises you can't keep. Shame get, it causes us getting our self-worth from the things that you do, not your relationship with God and who you are in Christ. Shame causes an inability to come to a place of honesty with God because we somehow believe, because of our mistakes, we have no true value. Shame causes us to concentrate on our sin instead of concentrating on our Savior. So why is shame so deadly? Because it strips us with the power to change. It keeps us from receiving the provision God made for our sin through the blood of Christ. And there's a difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is about what we've done. But shame is, because, is, is tied to who we think we are. With guilt, we can always get a fresh start. With shame, we're caught in a noose because the problem stays with us. In fact, with shame, we think we're the problem. The solution to getting rid of shame is to see ourselves as God sees us. So... They're asking for you to read Psalms 103, verse 10 through 13, as well as, as 1 John 1 and 9. And um, it gives the understanding of shame, what is um, healthy and what is not. So you must ask yourself, have I ever become overcome by shame? And what steps should I take to remove the barrier of shame? I believe the steps are to accept the price that Jesus paid for us. Understand that his blood covers all sins. That we are not defective. That even with our faults and flaws, God loves us so much that he comes alongside us with the power of his spirit to help us overcome and get to where he wants us regardless of the shortcomings and failures we've had in our past. Victimization is a natural response to sin. The devil made me do it. The woman you gave me made me do it. Instead of taking responsibility for our, fail our failures, we blame others by displacing responsibility. And we point the finger saying, you're not good enough. Or we blame ourselves and get into condemnation thinking, I'm just a mess. I'm just not good enough. I'll never make it. That's shame speaking and condemnation. In blaming others, we look at everything in terms of right and wrong. We say, if my husband would just treat me right, I wouldn't be so manipulative and, 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 and unhappy. If my family wasn't so backbiting, I wouldn't be so hurt. If everyone would just live like they're supposed to, 
everything would work out just right. Here's the result of victimization. We notice other people's sins, but never see our own. It's amazing how we can condemn sin to other people, but never stop to take into account our shortcomings. Jesus talked about going for the moat in your brother's eye when you have a beam in your own. Victimization blames ourselves by saying, I've just always been this way. I'll never change. I'll just never be good enough. And we feel rejected. That's all the result of victimization. Whether we blame others or ourselves with victimization, we are powerless to change, and this is why victimization is so deadly. So you need to ask yourself, are there any areas in your life, perhaps your parents, others in your past, in your marriage, at work, with friends, or even at the church you work with, where you have taken on a victim mentality? How should you change your way of thinking regarding that situation? And there's a space where you can write your answer. With shame and victimization, we're either the Pharisee or the woman caught in adultery. We're saying either you're not good enough or we're saying I'm not good enough. Based on our relationship with God, or, excuse me, we try to base our relationship with God and others on good works or bad works. That's just not the way God set things up. That is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thinking. It keeps us from changing and connecting with God. A reality must understand that the devil does not want us to change. We must get to a point, no matter what happens, we take responsibility for our own lives. We can no longer blame others for our level of relationship with God. Where I am with God is not a result of me not having a good church around or not having spiritual people in my life. And I just don't have a good pastor. I just haven't had opportunities. It is up to me to have a proper relationship with God by every day spending time in his presence, seeking his face, and letting his word transform my mind. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is counterfeit to a relationship with God. Your identity is not based on your own efforts. Let me say it again. Who you are is not based on your efforts. It is based on the finished work that Jesus did on Calvary. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. The fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil lacks the power to transform the heart. It can provide facts and information, but it's powerless to give you life. So, beloved, I don't care if you don't have a good church within 10 states of you. You not having a good relationship with God is between you and God. I believe you could be on the backside of the desert without one church within 100 miles and have a powerful walk with God because every day you read his word and you seek his face, and you let your mind become transformed by the power of the word of God. That's what makes us powerful. Jesus spoke to people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. I invite you to write on the last page, the journal, when you're done with this lesson, what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. In closing, I want to admonish you. The tree of life is seeking an intimate walk with God, coming to know Him. I can tell you, this past year has been some of the deepest trials of my life. The deepest stripping, the deepest loss, the deepest pain. I haven't been perfect, but I know the only reason why I'm standing in front of you right now, speaking to you and teaching you the Word of God, is because every single day that I was able to this year. I woke up and I spent time pouring my heart out to God, just seeking His face. I spent time in His Word. I spent time fasting and praying to draw closer to Him, to hear His voice more clearly. Beloved, turn away from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Quit beating yourself with shame. Quit living behind the chains of victimization. You are not a victim of your circumstance. 
You are not going to remain who you are forever. Within you is a beautiful, beautiful diamond that God is going to bring and reveal to the world that he has been preparing. If you will denounce the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and receive and embrace the tree of life, and that's coming to know Jesus in a deep and intimate way. Anymore, I try to surround myself with people that are kingdom-minded, that are life-givers, that their view is a tree of life. And the view of the goodness of the grace of God and living in faith of that grace to work in your life. I pray this teaching today has helped you on your journey to shake free the chains of religious order and legalistic ideas and to rest, to rest in Him, to rest in His love, to rest knowing that He's as passionate about you as you think you are about Him. He loves you. He's forgiven you. He said in His Word, if you confess and forsake your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus told the woman, caught in adultery, go your way and sin no more. So my friend, don't allow shame, condemnation, unhealthy guilt. Don't allow victimization to rob you of the most precious things of life, namely, a beautiful, dynamic walk with God. Father, right now I pray, those that I've taught today, that you will reveal to them yourself in the tree of life. Your love, your joy and peace, your grace extended to us. God, help us not to be victims, to try to blame others, to blame and, 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 and to just try to accept who we are just because we've always been that way, but to have the courage to persevere and to allow your word and your presence and most importantly, your love to be ch bring change in our lives. I pray for all who have done this class today that you will strengthen them and be with them and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. I pray this teaching was of strength to you. Um, this teaching will be on the replay for 72 hours, which means for 72 hours or six more days, it'll be up for you if you want to go back and watch it again, or if you want to take notes and, and, and reference uh, some of the things I've said tonight. But after 72 hours, it will be taken down in uh, preparation for the next week's, next Tuesday night's teaching. Now, um, next Tuesday, I may have to make an adjustment. Uh, let me check something here. I try to leave my Tuesdays open, but every now and then, I end up with... Um... Okay, it's fine. I'll be teaching next Tuesday, the 17th, at the same time. But the following Tuesday, the 24th... Um... I'll be teaching that night, but I'm going to be in California, so I won't have, I hope I have good good connection, but we'll just see how it goes. So God bless you. This is John Rakovio. I love you. Thank you for joining us. I pray that you're beginning to feel the chains and the bondages of legalism and religious mindsets freed from you, that you can walk in the liberty and the freedom that only Jesus gives. Have a great day, and Lord willing, we'll see you next Tuesday at 7 p.m. Central Time.